This morning, I'm going to be preaching out of the book of Psalms, and, and we, have, we are going to be here for the entire summer. We've called this series Psalms for the Summer, and uh, you know, what's weird is it's been almost a month since I've preached in this room and on this series. I think that's probably the longest I've ever gone between, um, between preaching dates, and um, I'm going to, I, I was planning on preaching on Psalm 13 this morning, and I finished reading through it on Monday. It's, it's a psalm that I'd memorized in the past, and I read through it, and I just kept reading. And I read Psalm 14, and I'm like, you know what? That's really good, too. <laughs> and I completely changed my message. I might circle back to Psalm 13 at some point. We're not going in order. But there's a reason that I'm preaching on this particular chapter this morning, and uh, it's kind of a two-part um, message mini series within the series. So we have Psalm 14 today, and we're going to do Psalm 139 uh, next week. And they're kind of part one and part two. They go together. You'll understand a little bit more about that as we get into it today. Um, so Psalm 14. If you have a Bible this morning, you are welcome to turn there with me. We're going to have the um, them on the verses on the screen as well, uh, but it's helpful to, to follow along. If you don't have a Bible, there's some in the seat pockets in front of you. If you don't own a Bible, just take one of those. That's our gift for you. We'd love for you to have that as well. All right, Psalm 14. It says, to the choir master of David, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds, and there is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand and who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. And there is none who does good, not even one. Have they no knowledge? All the evildoers who eat up my people, as they eat bread, do not call upon the Lord. There they are in great terror, for God is with the generation of the righteous. You would shame the plans of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, let Jacob rejoice, let Israel be glad. You know, um, there's, there's something I want us to understand as, as kind of the first premise as we look into this passage. We're going to go back and kind of look more in depth at each of these verses. And one of the things that I love about some of these shorter psalms is you have a little more time to actually go in and look at the words and what it actually says and, and really evaluate um, what it means to us today as a believer. And, and one of the things that, that I began to see as I was studying this particular um, passage is that belief in God requires faith, but it doesn't require blind faith, right? It doesn't require us to shut off our brains and, and not observe the things in the world around us because one of the biggest contentions between people of faith and secularists or atheists, uh, a lot of it really has to do with the origin of the universe, and in many scientific communities, the idea that the earth was created by, by an intelligent being, by a God, um, is a source of ridicule and mockery. But here's the reality of the world that we actually live in. Science will never disprove the existence of God. In fact, good science reinforces the reality of his nature and his hand at work. Now, we read in that first verse that it says that, that a fool says there is no God. And, and the word fool here is the word nabal. Uh, it, it really doesn't mean that it's, it's somebody who's stupid or unintellectual. It doesn't mean that somebody uh, doesn't have a brain or can't think or can't process or can't analyze. Uh, really, this, this foolishness that Psalms is telling us about here really has more to do with morality than with intellect. There are a lot of brilliant people in the world that don't believe in God, right? They can think, they can analyze, they can speak eloquently, they can argue a point, um, but they don't understand where they came from. In fact, I think that's specifically why it says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. 
It's one thing to understand something intellectually or to believe something intellectually, but it's another thing for it to impact the way that you feel, the way that you act, the way that you, um, the, what you do with your understanding. And it's the man who says he needs no God that's unaware of his own brokenness. It might even be that somebody thinks there is a God out somewhere, but they're indifferent about God's actual existence. They don't think that it impacts their life at all. In fact, we would refer to this as an agnostic, right? Somebody that believes that, yeah, there's probably a God out there somewhere, but it doesn't impact the way that I live or believe or, or anything that I do. They don't have any use for God's existence. And scripture is saying that person is foolish. Now, there are um, actually four arguments that are kind of widely accepted for the existence of God. And we're going to talk about three of them this morning because it, uh, this passage addresses three of them. And then the fourth one we're going to talk about next week. And that's why it's kind of a, a two-part message. But the first one is, is the cosmological argument for God. And that's the existence of the universe means that there has to be a God. Then uh, we'll talk about the teleological argument. And maybe these words are just completely, who cares? You don't, you don't need to know these words. But the idea behind this argument is that the existence of design in the universe means that there has to be a designer, right? And then there's the moral argument for the existence of God. And that is that the existence of morality means that there must be a God who governs the universe. The last one, which we'll talk about next week, is the anthropological argument for God. And that's that the nature and the character of humanity means that there has to be a relational God. And, and that's what we're going to look at next week in Psalm 139. But let's start with this first one, the cosmological argument for God. Have you guys heard about the James Webb Space Telescope? This is kind of big news right now. Uh, just in the past week, we've seen the first images of this brand new space telescope, and uh, it is working incredibly well. Um, it's, there are some incredible pictures of the universe that God has created. In fact, I have a few of them here. These are images taken from this new space telescope. Um, they're, they're absolutely... Uh, light years and light years away. These are galaxies in the distance. I mean, just some incredible, incredible pictures. And, and I just read an article in the New York Times about five things that we've learned from this particular telescope. And, and one of them is that the universe out there is so much more than, than what we initially knew about. There's so much more to see than what we previously even knew existed. Uh, and, and that really speaks to the awesomeness of our creator. Now, um, one of the observations uh, from these images, that this last one that, that I showed you, uh, this is a distant star cluster called the SMACS 0723. What a great name, right? They couldn't have come up with something a little bit more creative there. But this star cluster, um, it shows light that origin originated 13 billion years ago. Now, maybe you're thinking, wait a second. Now, I've read the Bible. It says that, that God created the heavens and the earth and that um, it lists all these different generations. And so um, if, if we believe the biblical account that the earth is only about 6,000 years old, so how do you justify that with what we see from science? Well, there are actually several different ways to explain this. Um, one theory is that the, the seven days of creation were not seven literal days and that the earth was shaped and designed over billions of years. Uh, we know that time, from scripture, we know that time, that God doesn't view time the way, same way that man does, right? He says a, a, a day to him is like a thousand years to us. So what's millions and billions of years in the scope of all eternity, uh, so maybe the seven days were a framework to help us understand rather than a literal timeline. Um, another theory is that there's a gap between Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. In fact, we read in Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And some people, some Christian scientists have speculated that there are billions of years between verse 1 and verse 2 where it says the earth was without form and void 
and darkness over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And, and as we read in the next few verses, God shaped and formed the earth, and so maybe that could explain how God created the earth, and then at some point, millions or billions of years later, he began to form it with his hands and shape it into the world that we see today. The third possibility is, is maybe the simplest solution, but Maybe it's that God just created the universe to look old, right? It, he created Adam as a fully formed adult man, right? It, we don't see that Adam was, was created as, as a baby. We see him created as a man. So why couldn't he create the earth to look fully formed and developed as well? Do you know what I personally believe about creation? Neither do I, <laughs> right? <laughs> Listen, it's fun to think and to wonder about how God did it, but we don't need to know the details. I, I just believe that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's what scripture tells us. And sometimes we can get caught up in, in the dogma and we just need to understand that we don't need to be right about everything, right? Sometimes appreciating the wonder and the mystery of God and, and how he formed things and how he created things is, is greater honor and reverence than trying to figure out every single detail. If you were smart enough to understand everything about God and everything that he's done, would you really need a savior? Just, just to be clear though, I, I don't believe in, in what we've kind of termed macro evolution, that one species uh, evolves into another over time. I think that goes against what scripture teaches. And that's not a proven scientific fact, even though it's kind of taught that way. It's a theory and it can't be proven because it didn't happen. Okay, so <laughs> there you go, all right? <laughs> anyway, um, that's the, the, the first idea of, of proving God's existence is this cosmological argument. It's, it's everything that's in the world that there has to be somewhere where that came from. The second argument is the, the teleological argument, and this is my favorite because uh, it's a big word. Uh, no, I, I saw this the other day on Instagram, and uh, there was a, a pastor who was talking about the atheist scientist Sir Roger Penrose. And Sir Roger Penrose calculated the odds that the entire universe is as orderly as our galactic uh, neighborhood is. Um, and, and so he said the odds of that happening, the earth being the way that it is, the planets aligning the way that they are, everything working together the way that they, uh, they do is, is 10 billion to the 123rd power. Now, how many would say, okay, that means absolutely nothing to me? I know that's a big number, right? That means absolutely nothing to me. All right, let, let me give you a picture of how big this number is. If the zeros in that 10 billion to the 123rd power were this big, they would stretch across the entire universe and continue. Get, get this, this is, this is my favorite picture. The odds that that were to happen, that everything were to come together, are more likely that you would win the lottery 10,000 times in a row. And get struck by lightning every time you went to pick up the ticket. Christopher Hitchens, another atheist, says this. This argument is the most compelling argument for the existence of God. Listen, here's what, what faith actually is. Faith is acknowledging that there's somebody out there that knows more than us. Right? And believing in God's existence is not a stretch. Believing that everything that we have in this world today just happened is a much bigger leap of faith than believing in an intelligent designer, someone that created this world third argument and what this passage really focuses on is the moral argument for God. Um, and we read in the second part of verse one, it says, they are corrupt, those who don't believe in the existence of God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. The Lord looked down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, if there are any who seek after God. 
So we started out with like those who don't believe in God, and then God looks down at the earth and looks at everyone, those who are following him, those who believe in him, those who don't, everyone together, and says, they've all turned aside. Together they've become corrupt. There's not even one who does good. Now this is a, a, a problem <laughs> when we're talking about our world today, because um, if you want to start a fight with someone, just tell them that they're not a good person. It doesn't matter what they've done. It doesn't matter uh, about their past. Like, they'll acknowledge their mistakes. They'll acknowledge that they've made mistakes. But, but if you try to tell someone that they're not a good person, they will fight you on that topic. Here's the difference between a worldly person and a godly person, a true Christian. The Christian is aware of how broken and messed up and sinful they are and how much they need a savior. It's not that we are better or or more righteous on our own or that we've somehow unlocked the code to being a good person. None of us have. In fact, you probably sinned on your way to church this morning. But thanks be to the grace of God, right? Thanks be to his incredible mercy, his incredible grace, because we are all broken, We're desperately in need of a savior. And the only difference, the only thing that separates us from the world out there is that we recognize our brokenness and our need for a savior and our need for his righteousness. Now, despite that immorality and that selfishness in our world today, it's also clearly evident that everyone has some sense of morality Now, that line of morality can be moved or blurred or ignored. But, I mean, if you ask enough questions, you're going to learn that that people have some sense of morality or some understanding that there are certain things in this world that are right and that are wrong. Now, maybe you're asking the question this morning, like, why is this even important that, that we're talking about the existence of God? I already believe in God. That's why I came to church this morning. Well, let me give you a few reasons why this is so important. First of all, maybe there are people here who are wrestling with those questions. And you're wondering if it's even okay or right to believe in God and who he is and what he said. Listen, we all struggle with doubts. And in those seasons where we're questioning our faith, where we're we're wrestling with those difficult questions... It's okay to look at scripture and use the truth of God's word to remind yourself not only of what you believe, but why you believe it. Don't let those lies just continue to sit there and fester and and govern your mind and shape the way that you think. Go to the truth of God's word. Be reminded of that truth and correct those thoughts so that your mind is focused on that truth. Uh, The second thing is that it will probably help you at some point answer someone else who's asking those questions. Because even if you believe in God, there are a lot of people around you that don't or that deny his existence or that deny that he has anything to do with our lives today. And so you're going to need to be able to to give an answer. And, And listen, we don't have to be ashamed of what we believe. We don't have to be embarrassed about that. We're not being ignorant. We're not being stupid. We're looking at, at the evidence that God has given us and saying, yeah, there has to be a God. There has to be a designer. And my life is evidence of his existence as well. And the third thing is that we need to make sure that our children and our grandchildren are being taught the truth. Listen, they're not being taught the truth by the world, Right? The, the reality of who God is is not something that, that this world values or that this world holds highly. And it's up to us to pass that truth on to the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. Maybe you're like, well, I'm done raising my kids. Well, listen, there are a lot of kids out there that don't have a, a godly parent or a godly grandparent, and you have an opportunity to speak into their life and to tell them the truth and to point them to a Savior who loves them and who cares about them. So what does it look like as a Christian being in this world that is filled with unbelievers? Well, the world will always look for selfish motivation first. Now, this is, this is who we are at our core. 
right? Our nature is sinful. You don't have to teach a kid how to sin, right? They are born sinful. When they don't get their way, what do they do? They cry. From the day that they're born, when they're told no, when you tell your two-year-old no, what happens? They throw a temper tantrum. It's not because you got an evil two-year-old. That's just, that's how they all operate, right? I mean, you did get an evil two-year-old because we're all born that way. We're all born evil, right? And it's, it's only through the redeeming work of Christ. That, that doesn't mean that, that somebody who doesn't know Christ can't do something good or that can't do something positive. But ultimately, we're all pulled in this selfish direction unless there is a correction by the work of the Holy Spirit in our life that changes the way that we think. That's the process of repentance. That's what it means to, to surrender your heart to Christ and, and to, to repent of your sin and to choose to follow Christ. It changes the way that you think so that you're no longer driven by selfish motives anymore. And you're still at war with those feelings because that's, that's part of your, your sinful nature that you're still battling with. But God can set you free from that. He can give you new hope. He can give you new direction. And it's through the righteousness of Christ Jesus that we're forgiven, that we're made whole. The world will always look to selfish motivation first. Um, now, the first part of this, this psalm that we just read, the first three verses, talks about the foolishness of the world, those who don't believe and trust in God. The second part is written to the righteous in an unrighteous world how it impacts us living in a world where people don't acknowledge the existence of our God. Um, verse 4 says it this way. It tells us that these evil people eat up my people as bread and do not call on the Lord. You know, it may seem in our world today that evil is winning, that evil is strong, that they have the upper hand, that everything goes the way of the unrighteous. Um, but verse 5 tells us the reason that they act that way is because they're afraid. That they see God's hand on the righteous and that they react to that. So we, we have a choice as believers. We can be reactionary like the world. And we can say, if you're going to react that way, I'm going to react even worse. <laughs> or we can trust in who God is and who he made us to be. It says that a day is coming where there will be great terror because they do not see something. Uh, they, they see something in this redeemed community, in this, this uh, fellowship of believers in, in the church, essentially, that will um, bring fear in their heart because they don't have it. And, and the psalmist says that they act and oppose what they can't see. That God is with those who are righteous. You know, Albert Einstein actually saw this truth in, on display in Germany prior to World War II. Uh, here's what he said. Being a lover of freedom, when the Nazi revolution came, I looked to the universities to defend it, knowing that they'd always boasted of their devotion to the cause of truth. But no, the universities were immediately silenced. Then I looked to the great editors of the newspaper whose flaming editorials in days gone by had proclaimed their love of freedom, but they, like the universities, were silenced in a few short weeks. Only the church stood squarely across the path of Hitler's campaign for suppressing truth. I've never had any special interest in the church before, but now I feel a great affection and admiration for it. Because the church alone has the courage and persistence to stand for intellectual and moral freedom. I'm forced to confess that what I once despised, I now praise unreservedly. Isn't that powerful? Right? That's somebody from the outside saying, listen, the church had the courage to stand for the truth. Are people still seeing that today? I hope so. I hope they're seeing that in this church. And verse 6 goes on to talk about how ungodly people take advantage of the poor, but the Lord is their refuge. Blaise Pascal was a brilliant mathematician, Christian philosopher. And he wrote 
about our wrestling act of believing in God. Here's what he said. If there were no obscurity, man would not feel his corruption. But if there were no light, man would not hope for a remedy. Thus it is not only just, but useful for us that God should be concealed in part and revealed in part, since it is equally dangerous for man to know God without knowing his misery and to know his own misery without knowing God. In other words, it's dangerous to believe in God without recognizing our need for him, right? But even worse, the possibility of understanding our own sinfulness and our brokenness and our need for him without the hope of a savior. One of my heroes is a a man named Charles Spurgeon. Um, And uh, he's recorded many of of his messages and they're they're written down. And he actually preached on this verse, verse six of uh, of Psalm chapter 14, which, um, hey, he can preach a whole sermon on on one verse. I'm not quite there yet, but here's here's what he said. Uh, he He was talking in London at the time. He said, you young men in the firms of London... You working men that work in the factories, you are sneered at. Let them sneer. If they can sneer you out of your religion, you have not got anything worth having. Remember that you can be laughed into hell, but you can never be laughed out of it. Isn't that a powerful truth? Go on to to read the the last verse and, and... like a lot of psalms that David wrote, the the hope is at the end. And here's the hope of this passage. Psalm 14, verse 7, it says, Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion when the Lord restores the fortunes of his people. Let Jacob rejoice. Let Israel be glad. Worship team, would you guys come back up here? They're going to lead us in a song in just a second, but... I want us to understand something. The only thing that separates you from the fool in verse 1 is your hope in the Lord. It's not because you're better. It's not because you're smarter. It's the recognition of your own failure, of your own inadequacies, of your own sinfulness that leads you to understanding your need for a Savior. Do you know that this psalm that we just read is actually a prophetic picture of Jesus? There are three ways that I see in in this psalm that point to our Savior. The first one is in verse 3 when it talks about um, the, the issue of no one good being on this earth, of, of the inherent sinfulness of man. And here's the first picture of Jesus. Jesus is the answer to the problem that there's no one who was good. Yeah, no one at this point had lived a sinless sinless life. But when Jesus came, he showed us what perfection is. He lived a perfect life. He lived without sin, and he's that hope for us. Second thing is that Jesus was the ultimate example of the poor one who was despised. We just read that in verse six, right? Talking about about the one who is poor and despised by the world. And Jesus came to this earth, lived with a poor family, was born in a stable, lived without a home for a, a good portion of his life trusting the Lord to provide for every need that he had. He was rejected, he was humble, and he came to serve. The third thing is that Jesus is the salvation of Israel to come out of Zion. Like we just read in verse 7. Oh, that salvation would come out of Zion. He has. He has. What David was crying out for hundreds of years before he was born, Jesus fulfilled that cry in that moment. 
He is our salvation. He is our hope. And we can communicate that hope to the world around us. We can point them to a Savior who loves them, who wants to change their life. Can we stand together in this place? Maybe you're wrestling this morning with some doubts. Maybe you're struggling with, with what you believe. Maybe you're, you're fighting against that tension of, of, of you know, what the world is, is offering and what it means to follow Christ. Maybe you've been mocked or challenged in your faith. Maybe it feels like everything in this world is against you and that, that no matter what you try to do, that, that you're on the losing side. Can I tell you something? There's hope in Jesus Christ. There's salvation for you in what he did on the cross. He fulfilled that promise and he gave us hope. That's something to rejoice in today gives us strength, it gives us courage, it gives us peace. So I want to just ask in this place, if, if you're struggling with doubt this morning, or you're just wrestling with some ideas, or, or just feeling discouraged, I want, to, I want to say a prayer for you this morning. And I'd ask that you just take a bold step of faith today, and just say, yeah, that's me, I need some prayer this morning. And would you just acknowledge that by just raising your hand today? I just want to pray for you this morning. There's no shame in, in wrestling with those things hands going up across this place. Anybody else? Just want to give a second. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for each person with their hand raised this morning that's saying, yeah, God, I'm wrestling with this. I'm struggling with this right now. Lord, we know that you are big enough to answer every question. And so, God, we are trusting in you today. We don't trust the things that this world has to offer. Uh, we don't look to politics. We don't, we don't look to, to wealth or fame or, or anything that, that this world says provides hope. But Lord, we look to you, to the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, to, to the salvation that we have in your son. So Lord, we just pray that your peace would rest on them, Lord, that those, those doubts would, would be turned into faith, God, that, that you would remind them of your love today, Lord, that they would tangibly feel your presence this morning, and Lord, that it would move them, Lord, in a path of faith and obedience in a new way today, in Jesus' name.